so thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the organizer for giving me the opportunity to tell you about milk oligosaccharides. So as Maria said, I'm from Glycom. It's based in Denmark, in Copenhagen, the capital. We have our offices and we have our labs. If you then sit in your car, drive west for three hours, this is a lot in Denmark, but I guess in US standard it's not a lot, you have our factory in Esbjerg, a quite small city with lots of fish. So Glycom was founded in 2005, and one of our investors is Nestlé. So throughout these 12 years, we have successfully developed three technological platforms so first, to make available human milk oligosaccharides at large scale, at reasonable cost. We have also completed two safety and tolerance trials, one in adults and one in, in infants, and that was together with Nestlé. We have also notified GRASS, a novel food approval, for our lead compounds. And we were the first to get a product launch in Europe in 2016. So going to our factory, its large-scale production is coming upstream. So we have multiple 100-ton um, scale production using 500 cubic meter fermenters. They are quite big and quite impressive standing on the top looking down. So our vision is to contribute to human health through HMOs. And we do that by implementing a rich, efficacy-focused preclinical and clinical pipeline. As, and as Maria said, so I'm heading the preclinical, so a lot of the talk will be about this. But just to talk a little bit about human milk oligosaccharides, many of you may know them, but for those who, who don't, well, they're very un unique, both in their abundance and their complexity. And if you take the first bar plot, you can see um, human milk and cow milk. And it's very easy to see the difference. So you have human milk oligosaccharides, you find about 15 gram per liter in human milk, and in cow's milk is under one gram per liter. And this is quite amazing since it's cow milk that we actually use for infant formula. But this is the concentration. What about the complexity, the structures? In human milk so far, we have found about 200 different structures. And when we compare this to cow's milk, they have about 13 different structures. Some are the same, but you can imagine we have, you know, quite different more. The, the mom is actually able to, to produce quite a different kinds of range. So until now, the knowledge we have on human milk oligosaccharides is based on infants, like uh, breastfed infant compared to formula fed infants. And what we have seen is that it affects the microbiota, it can protect against infection, it can also help develop immune system and gut barrier function. And why can they do this? So one of the things is actually this unique structures. And you heard from Eric Madsen yesterday about the N or the O glycan, sorry. And that is the mucus glycans. And I've made a kind of a template structure. That is the first structure you see. Um, so this is human milk oligosaccharides that is based on five building blocks. So they have galactose, glucose, forming lactose, and then they can have lacnac, they can have fucose, or they can have silic acid. And then they can be combined like LIGO. I'm from Denmark, I like LIGO. Um, and then can be combined in these 200 different structures. And then if you look under the HMO template structure, you can see the oak glycans, and they look quite similar. Also, if you have the cell surface glycans, so this is the end glycans, again, you see a similar structure to those of HMOs. So this comes to the function, because HMOs can function as a decoy receptor because pathogenic bacteria, viruses, is quite structure specific. They are here to specific structures. And then when you have HMOs, they may kind of trick the pathogenic bacteria, virus, whatever, to adhere to the HMOs instead of the epithelial cell or the mucus layer, and then you can inhibit infection. Studies have also shown, and that's uh, only in vitro studies, have shown that HMOs can actually affect the gene expression of glycans on epithelial cells, which means that then the structure 
uh, changes. And again, you can inhibit uh, the adhesion of pathogenic bacteria, but here you can also help develop or mature the gut or the gut barrier. And one key effect is, of course, the ability of specific bacteria to utilize the HMOs. This is quite clear from infant studies, and I'm also going to talk about more about this. And of course, when you have the development, we heard a lot about the production of then, for example, metabolites like short-chain fatty acids. So now I'm going to show some of our in vitro studies that we have made to get an understanding of the microbiota and the metabolites. And we looked at adults, because at Glycom we are interested to see if HMOs can actually benefit adults. Last year, uh, we published a paper on a clinical trial where we gave adults HMOs. Um, but we also want to see what is really happening, because one thing is that you give a human the, uh, the HMOs, you get the fecal samples, you get some information here, but as you know, we can't, not, we can't really chop up a human being. So this is why we want to get some more insight to the microbiota and the metabolites to see what is actually happening. And first we made this kind of a short-term um, fermentation to see what is actually happening with the HMOs, what is happening with the microbiota in an adult, or uh, microbiota from an adult. And what we saw respect to the metabolites, so the acetate and the propionate were significantly increased, but also the butyrate. And actually also after 48 hours you see still an increase in the butyrate and some decrease in the acetate and propionate, which could indicate that there are actually some bacteria that are able to use the acetate to produce butyrate. I will dig a bit into that on uh, some of our next slides. But of course we also look at the microbiota. And in this batch fermentation system we only did some QPCR. And not so surprising, we saw a really increase in bifidobacteria. So even though the microbiota came from an adult, the bifidobacteria are st still able to utilize human milk oligosaccharides. But this was a short-term fermentation. We also wanted to see what is actually happening when it's for a longer time. So we chose to use this model. So this is the Prodigest Emsheim model. So Prodigest is a company from Belgium. Um, and this is a dynamic model where we wanted to see, okay, what is happening along the intestine and over time in microbiota and metabolites. So we have a, a kind of a stability and control period for four weeks. We have a treatment period for three weeks, and then we had a washout for two weeks. So what is happening when we take out the HMOs? And first we looked at how or were the HMOs fermented. And that we do by looking at the consumption. So to see about the bases and the acids. And you see a drop in the pH, so you have to add some uh, bases to have it kind of balanced. And we could see that both in the proximal part of the colon, so this simulated system, the proximal part of the colon and the distal part of the colon, the HMOs are fermented. That this was for a mix, so 2FL, a fucosylated HMOs, and a neutral core HMO, so this is a LNNT. And then we also looked at just adding 2FL. So digging a bit deeper into the metabolites, so we looked at acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And for the first couple of, uh, of uh, figures, this is for the mix. So the PC, the proximal part of the colon, and under there, the distal part of the colon. And you can see immediately an increase in short-chain fatty acids, increase in acetate and propionate. And that kind of keeps for the next three weeks. But then it gets interesting when we go to 2FL. There you have immediately an increase in acetate and propionate. But you see something happening in week three. You have an increase of butyrate and a decrease of the acetate and propionate. So here we can actually see, almost with our own eyes, that acetate is utilized to produce butyrate. We also looked at some of the more detrimental metabolites. They will also talk about this with the proteolytic activity. And 
what we saw was that in the treatment period, T1, T2, T3, for both the mixture and the 2FL, we have a decrease in ammonia and a decrease of uh, branch chain short fatty acids, which indicates that you kind of shift the metabolism towards a more psycholytic activity. But this is the activity of the bacteria. So what about the bacteria? So we did 16S sequencing targeting the V3 region. And what we saw was that there was a decrease in bacteroidetes. And actually some of the genera within this uh, phylum has proteolytic activity, which could fit with this decrease in some of the more detrimental metabolites. We also saw an increase in the firmicutes. And when we dig, dig a little, little bit deeper, when I looked at the, the microbiota for the fam on family level, and I'm going to show you that, we actually saw an increase in lactospirasiae. And within that family, we actually also have butyrate-producing bacteria. We also see an increase in virucomicrobia. And I think that was actually quite interesting because that was only in the distal part of the colon, which means that we can affect not only in the proximal, but also in the distal, there are some changes in the microbiota. Okay, it's a simulated system, but still it gives us some information. So we dig a bit deeper. So we use qPCR to identify bifidobacteria, because when you talk about HMOs, immediately you think of bifidobacteria. And what we saw was an increase, significantly increase, when you have the HMOs for both the mixture and the 2FL. So this was in the lumen when you have the first two graphs. And then we wanted to see what is happening in the mucus. Because in the m you have integrated mucus capsules to simulate this mucus layer. And we saw that HMOs were actually also able to infect the bifidobacteria in this mucus, but here only in the proximal part of the colon and not in the distal part. Again, we dig a bit deeper to see, so what is actually happening on species level? Because one thing is that you have bifidobacteria, but as you know, there is a lot and they can do different stuff. What we saw was, we use ITS, so the interspace region, of 16S and uh, 23S. And what we saw was that in these two systems, with the mix and the 2FL, so the control were more or less the same profile, a little bit different, but more or less the same. Within one week, we see quite an increase, relative abundance, quite an increase of bifido adolescentis. And I have to admit, I was kind of, what? Because so far in literature, it's not really known that Bifido adolescentis is able to use, utilize HMOs. But the data shows what the data shows. And this was also what we saw in the human trial. When we dug into the uh, OTU, we saw that it was Bifido adolescentis within two weeks that we are, were increased in these people. Then you go to three weeks, and what is then happening? Well, there is a shift in the species. So you get an increase in relative abundance of Bifidobacterium bifidum and Bifidobacterium longum. And then here you see a decrease of the Bifido adolescentis. So we really have to take into account, you know, how long do we do these different kinds of trials? Because you could say for the two-week intervention study we have in the, in the human study, th that was a bit maybe too short, because something is really happening within three weeks, we have no clue what is happening after four weeks, etc. So then I told you about looking into the family level. So I dig a bit into the, the microbiota data, looking at family level, looking at genius level, to see, okay, so what is a possible mechanism of, um, of utilization of HMOs? So you have the HMOs, Bifidobacteria are utilizing HMOs, not that a surprise. Acetate, lactate is produced. And what I saw in the data was that Valionella or Valionellaceae, and especially the genus Valionella and Megamonas were actually increased. They are able to produce propionate, so this could fit with the level of propionate or increase that we see in the data. Then we see an increase, but that was later around week two, week three, in lactospirasiae. And when I looked into genius level, I could see that it was uh, coprococcus, 
Blautia, some species within Blautia are actually able to produce butyrate and also uh, Eobacterium halley. So this could fit with the increase of the 2FL of the, of the butyrate within the three week, or at week three. So, based on our preclinical or clinical trials, HMOs could be quite promising for improving human health. We see that they are quite biphenogenic, that we also see when we compare breastfed uh, and formula fed. They can improve uh, metabolic profile, so we saw this change in profile to a more saccharolytic compared to a proteolytic activity. In our clinical adult trial, I'm not showing you the data here, but you can see uh, the paper, it's published in British Journal of Nutrition in 2016. It is well tolerated. It was different concentration, 5, 10, and 20 gram. We gave these adults, so it was 100 people that were given these HMOs. Quite biphenogenic, and we saw a softening of stools. In the cl clinical trial with infants that was conducted by Nestle using our HMOs, we saw that they were highly biphenogenic. They had breast-fed infants as a reference group, and they could see in the microbiota metabolites profile that it kind of went towards the, uh, the breastfed profile. And then they could also see that it was quite a regulator of immune function. So now it was also kind of the talk uh, yesterday. So, okay, we increase some bacteria, we produce some short chain fatty acids. What does this mean? And of course, as we speak, we are actually conducting some clinical trial where we look at uh, clinical relevant outcomes. So hopefully this will go well. And thank you for listening. We have time for just one question. Who comes first? <laughs> hi, I'm, uh, hi, I'm from Jinke, another HMO producer, here in Oliver Sky. I'm just curious that uh, why everybody is concentrating on 2FL. What's wrong with 3FL? There is nothing wrong with 3FL. <laughs> because uh, so, we are actually. Okay, so you, have, so you have to choose, you have to start somewhere. There are 200 different kinds of HMOs and you have to, you know, start. With 2FL, this is the most abundant in human milk. And since Nestle is one of our investors and they are quite interested in 2FL, of course, because of this high percentage, this was the one that we started. And then we had LNNT, but then we have more coming on stream. All right, thank you.